All right, thank you. Um, I like how different uh, different languages pronounce my name very differently. The, the, the French one is nice. I attended something French. Always wrong that. Um, so I, I uh, thought I would optimistically kind of change the scope of my talk a little bit and, and discuss kind of general uh, general projects in my lab trying to develop new condensed matter probes based on NV centers in Diamond. Um, so just uh, to briefly introduce uh, the scope of what my lab does, I'm obviously not talking about all of these things, but my lab is roughly divided into three separate efforts, um, all of roughly equal magnitude. So we have a bunch of people who are working on nanoscale quantum sensing based on NV centers in Diamond, uh, also building up technologies for long distance quantum networks also based on solid state defects. Um, and then since I haven't seen a lot of people since COVID, that I would just mention that since COVID, we are now a superconducting qubit group as well. <laughs> and we're working on uh, new material systems for, uh, for quantum computing. Uh, OK, so I, I don't have to really introduce the NV Center in detail. So let me just uh, point out a few features that are important uh, for, um, you know, for this uh, quantum sensing project. So the first is that uh, because the NV Center has these very localized orbitals that are very far away from the <coughs> conduction and valence band edges of diamond, you can, to first order, really think of this as like an isolated atom or molecule. Um, and the nice thing about that is that you can use a lot of the tools that we have essentially from atomic physics for coherent manipulation and spin readout uh, and, and sort of utilizing the optical excited state without having to think very much about the surrounding lattice. Um, the thing that makes the NV Center really special, there are now you know, many, many defects in diamond and other materials that people are studying, um, but the NV Center is still the only defect that has very, very long spin coherence times at room temperature and under ambient conditions. So that makes it very attractive as a sensing platform. Um, and additionally, there is a very convenient method for optically manipulating and measuring the spin at room temperature. So of course, optically detected magnetic resonance is uh, sort of trivially present for essentially all cold atoms because you always have spin selective uh, transitions that you can, um, that you can uh, address. But uh, the nice thing about the NV Center uh, is, as Patrick was just discussing uh, just now, uh, there is sort of a, a convenient scheme for doing off-resonant uh, optical spin polarization and then kind of an accident of the level structure involving this metastable singlet state uh, that's, that makes the NV Center go dark when you're in one of the spin sublevels. So you can use that as a basis for spin readout. Um, and then I'll just mention that maybe we all see this as kind of trivial now, but what you can do is sort of take advantage of the fact that we have all of these coherent spin manipulation techniques and you know, these wonderful pulse sequences from the NMR and ESR communities over many, many decades. And then combine that with the last, I'd say, 30 or 40 years of single center imaging. And that really allows you to do uh, you know, very kind of sophisticated and sensitive magnetic field measurements at this extremely tiny uh, volume. And that's really what enables all of these experiments. OK, so uh, if I were to like, very glibly summarize what most people do when they are trying to probe uh, condensed matter phenomena using NV centers, it roughly falls into two different categories. So you can either just take the NV center and measure the magnetic field near the NV center. And that magnetic field can come from uh, currents, or it can come from spins, as, as Patrick was just showing. Um, or you can take NV centers and do noise spectroscopy. So you can measure sort of the components of the magnetic field at different frequencies of noise. Um, so there's been, you know, really a, a robust community developing these techniques. And uh, it's, you know, even to the point where you can buy kind of quasi-commercial systems for doing NV sensing and, and NV imaging. Um, so what we've been sort of interested in for the last couple of years is figuring out ways to, to connect the sensing that we do with NV centers uh, where we mostly just think of it as this little magnetic resonance probe and then we bring it next to the thing that we care about and trying to connect a little bit more directly with the language of condensed matter physics. So uh, you know, when you talk to condensed matter theorists, the kinds of things that they think about are not necessarily just what is the magnetic field picture if I'm you know, scanning many nanometers away. It's really things like order parameters, correlations across your, um, you know, across your material, uh, how does transport work in different regimes, um, how do I think about some excitation and its dispersion, and how do I think about susceptibility and ordering. Um, so sort of inspired by that general project, what we've been working on are a handful of techniques to try to connect a little bit more directly 
to that project. Uh, so um, I have a few efforts in my group using shallow NV centers, um, looking at spin dynamics, uh, using them as a, as a tool for nanoscale LMR, um, and then I'll spend the bulk of my talk talking about this, uh, this new technique, nanoscale covariance magnetometry. So NMR is not so relevant for condensed matter, so I won't talk about that story today. But let me just tell you a couple of quick stories that sort of show how uh, doing slightly different types of noise spectroscopy with the NV centers really enable completely new probes of, of the systems that are, that are of interest. Uh, okay, and um, just as a spoiler alert, we have not looked at any condensed matter targets yet, so, so I won't show I won't show any you know beautiful images of 2D magnets or anything. So this is this is a very NV centric talk. Um, okay, <clears throat> so one of the systems that we started looking at uh, uh, actually a very long time ago, I think some of the data that goes in this paper is from when I was a postdoc in, in Misha's group, even um, uh, is the is these sort of parasitic, uh, you know, contaminant surface spins that exist at the surface of diamond, and they're always there, and there's nothing that you can do to get rid of them. <laughs> um, so basically, you see these spin defects at the surface that are g equals to spin a half, um, and then people can see excess noise near the surface as you bring NV centers very close to the surface. Um, so we started uh, using a very simple technique to try to probe these, uh, which is double electron-electron resonance. So the idea is just that you do a Han echo sequence on your NV center, and then uh, in, in the middle of the sequence, when you flip the NV, you also flip, uh, in a frequency selective way, the surface spin path. So you have a, a different um, uh, microwave pulse uh, that flips these surface spins, which because they're G equals two spin a half, are at a very different uh, resonant frequency at this magnetic field from the NV center, so you can selectively address them. Um, and then by flipping that spin path, uh, what you do is, you know, you cancel out all of your quasi-static uh, uh, you know, inhomogeneity and the noise using your Han echo sequence, but then you intentionally do not cancel out the phase that you accumulate from these surface spins. So your resulting decay is essentially like a free induction decay measurement of the surface spins and their impact on the NV centers. So what you can do is, for example, a Han echo decay, which is in blue, and then I do this deer sequence and it gives you a faster decay in red. Um, and then I can just uh, normalize uh, my deer decay by my coherence decay to get out this, uh, this free induction decay of the deer spins. Um, <clears throat> okay, so as, as we were studying this, so that's the setup, uh, what we can see is that uh, we see a lot of these deer spins. Uh, we can plot the coupling rate to these deer spins as a function of depth away from the surface, and you can see that the coupling generally decreases with depth, which is what you would expect if these spins were residing at the surface. Um, and uh, sort of immediately, uh, we ran into one statistical puzzle associated with, uh, with this kind of set of curves, which is that if you, um, if you just calculate from the naive theory what the surface spin, surface spin uh, distance should be, um, then you get something like 15 nanometers. And we now have, uh, we're now interrogating NV centers that are much closer to the surface than this interspin distance. And in that case, I should not see a monotonic increase of uh, surface spin coupling as I go to the surface. Instead, you should just see increased variance because sometimes I should get unlucky or sometimes I should get lucky um, and have a surface spin either sitting right on top or very far away. Um, but instead, we see this basically monotonic increase across, uh, across many samples. And for a while, we just sort of swept this under the rug. Um, okay, so the other thing that we found uh, was that uh, we could do direct surface spectroscopy using X-ray absorption. And we saw that in samples where we see high deer coupling, we also see evidence of uh, this little peak at 282.5 EV, which people have attributed to dangling bonds sitting at the surface. So that seems kind of good, that maybe it's related to dangling bonds. And I'll, I'll spare you the long surface science story, but we were able to come up with a different annealing sequence that really preserves all of the surface characteristics and only changes these dangling bonds and we were able to, uh, to change this deer coupling rate uh, significantly without really affecting the NV coherence. Okay, so we think we have a pretty good handle on where these surface spins come from. Um, and then again, we see this statistical puzzle that now we're at surface spin densities that would correspond to much larger surface spin distances than the NV distance to the surface, and that makes this curve sort of not make sense. <laughs> Uh, okay, the other puzzle that we had kind of ignored for, for many years, and um, I should apologize retroactively to many, many undergrads in my group who came to me with data that was fitted to uh, the wrong exponent. And I said, no, that's the wrong exponent. <laughs> so you, you are wrong. 
Um, and I could just pull out Abraham and Bellini and say, like, look, you, you have to be wrong because it's not in here. Uh, and I just uh, bowled over them for many years. And then suddenly, we were all stuck at home during COVID and started looking a little bit more carefully at these data sets. And it turns out that actually, it, uh, you just you actually empirically get the wrong exponent. OK, so, so let me explain what I mean here. Um, so if I just uh, fit this, uh, you know, this coherence decay curve, what it should look like is some e to the minus gamma d or tau to some n, where if, um, you know, if you have perfectly Gaussian noise and you have a quasi-static bath, this n should just be 2. Now, I can write down a bunch of models that say that you can get an n that goes all the way down to 1. Um, and, but what we were finding was that uh, n equals 2 is, you know, a very poor fit to this curve. And actually, what you see is something that looks like a weird stretched exponential. And if once you start hunting for the stretched exponential, you can do a boatload of data fitting. So this is now from hundreds of NV centers. Uh, again, we were stuck at home in COVID. So we called up Misha's group and said, do you guys see this too? And we stuck together two giant data sets from two labs and found that, uh, indeed, two is a very poor fit to the data. And in fact, for many, um, for many NV centers, we even get an N that is less than one. And we see a general dependence with depth. So as you go closer to the surface, you have a lower exponent. <clears throat> okay. And as I alluded to in, um, you know, in the textbooks, you can get down to n equals 1 if you have a very fast bath. There is nothing in standard theory that says that you should ever have an n that's less than 1. So this seemed like kind of a weird puzzle. All right. The last puzzle that we had uh, is that in this regime, where you have very far apart surface spins compared to your NV center to surface distance, you should see coherent coupling all the time, right? I should just get lucky and occasionally see, you know, a single surface spin or two surface spins, and I should be able to see coherent oscillations. Um, and we could see that every once in a while, but it was extremely, extremely rare. It was only in something like 1 to 2 percent of centers, but at these densities, I should see it in something like 80 to 90 percent of the centers. Um, and maybe as a clue to the resolution to these puzzles, we could occasionally see this coherent coupling signal blink on and off on human time scales. So you could see coherent coupling, keep on interrogating the same NV center, the coherent coupling goes away, and then it returns. Um, okay, so how can I get a stretched exponential decay uh, in, in, this, uh, in this free induction decay measurement? Um, so let's imagine that I have an NV center that's staring at some you know, high density of surface spins then what you would get is some coherence decay curve that fits to an n equals 2. And then at some other instance of the measurement, I have the NV center looking at a low density bath. It would also give you an n equals 2, but then you would have some longer coherence time for the NV centers. Now, if the NV center was sampling different configurations of this bath over time, what you would do is average these two different decay curves, and then you would get something that looks like this funky stretched exponential. Um, and if you just naively fit this to a single exponent, then what you will get is actually an n that is less than 1. Um, so the key thing is that if we are looking at configurational averaging, you can then recover these exponents that are actually uh, less, than, less than 1. And in another context in the group, and many people have observed this, uh, we know that these baths should actually reconfigure with time because they photoionize. So we're constantly shining green light at this diamond. Uh, that can, uh, you know, rarely, but we also average for a very long time, uh, lead to two-photon ionization into the connection band. So then you sort of reshuffle the positions of all of these spin defects. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I'm just an experimentalist, so we just did numerics. <laughs> and what you can do is, for example, just take an NV center and just simulate many different configurations of this two-dimensional bath that's sitting, you know, at the surface. And for each, of these, uh, for each of these baths, you get some, you know, coherent cosine uh, oscillation. But now if I average all of these cosines together, then I get some funny-looking stretched exponent. And what you can see is that if you just fit uh, numerically what this exponent should look like, as you go to uh, uh, very shallow depths and low density, what you fit to is an exponent of two-thirds. And as you get far away from the surface, it looks like this, um, you know, classical uh, picture of n equals two. Um, so the idea is that the shallow NV center really sees a two-dimensional bath. And when it sees a two-dimensional bath, you get an exponent that looks like the uh, dimension divided by the interaction strength, so n equals two-thirds. But then uh, for a deeper NV center, you see this Gaussian noise bath, and then you just recover n equals two. Um, okay, those are just dumb numerics. But then uh, we went to Slava Dobrovitsky and said, you know, give us an actual analytical model. 
um, and, uh, and uh, Slava and a couple of uh, folks in, in uh, Misha's group developed a, a more analytical model for actually understanding these coherence decay curves. And actually, the, the way to really think about it is that for very short times, uh, uh, what you see are these distant contributions of many different spins. Um, and that essentially just looks like Gaussian noise. So at short times, you have this uh, n equals 2. And then at long times, um, you get your sort of first coherent coupling to the, to the closest spin that's sitting at the surface. And then you get a critical crossover to this n equals 2 thirds. So what I'm plotting here is um, it's a log, log, log plot of the coherence decay, which the important thing is that the slope of this curve is now just going to be this exponent. Um, and what, what the analytics say is that what you should actually see is that for short times in this coherence decay, you get uh, this slope. And then as you wait, then you eventually um, kind of collapse onto this slope. And that the position of this critical crossover time should depend on the depth of the NV center. Um, so uh, there's sort of this nice geometric picture, and sometimes this video works and sometimes it doesn't, where for very short times, you can define sort of this dipolar coupling volume, which is the, the evolution time for looking at the closest spin. And until you reach the surface, you're just looking at these distant contributions and Gaussian noise. And then once you hit the surface, you start averaging over the area of the surface. All right. So now armed with this analytical model, we can go back and uh, intentionally oversample this NV coherence decay like crazy and see whether or not we can really see this critical crossover time. And indeed, uh, if we oversample like crazy, we can see that at short times we get this N equals 2. At long times we have this N equals 2 thirds. And then um, importantly, if, if we just uh, eyeball where this, uh, uh, where this critical crossover time looks, uh, appears, you can translate that into something like this radius of the volume that you've sensed. Um, and we see that it happens at the same place where the NV depth is, which we can measure independently by uh, nano NMR. Um, so here it's you know, 5 nanometers, 6 and a half, and, and 10 nanometers. So the key thing here is that the reason that this crossover time is observable is that I can place my NV center wherever I want. Right? So I can pick where this crossover time is going to be just by putting the NV center at different distances away from this, uh, from this path. OK, that probably went by a little bit fast. But <laughs> so, uh, so in this first story, hopefully I've convinced you that just doing very careful measurements of the shape of your coherence decay can actually give you a local probe of some interesting features of the bath that you're staring at, like the dimensionality of the bath um, and the dynamics of that bath. Um, in this particular story, what we showed is that the surface spins are hopping around, which is maybe a little bit complicating for people who are trying to use them for sensing. Um, but maybe the key thing is that now if we're just looking at any arbitrary spin system, the fact that you can take this NV center and move it to different positions is really sort of the key. And there's, and there's some you know, neat applications potentially uh, for people who build scanning NV systems. Um, and I'll just point out that there is some related work also looking at sort of these exponents and, uh, and how you understand the shape of the coherence from uh, uh, Norm Yao and, and Anya Jayaj that, that also came out this year. Okay, so now I'm going to completely change gears and uh, tell you a quick story about covariance magnetometry. Um, so the idea here is that instead of looking at a single NV center and doing noise spectroscopy, what we can do is use two NV centers and look at uh, spatiotemporal correlations in the magnetic field. Um, so the setup here is that um, I have two NV centers. They're each staring at some correlated noise source that I'm interested in. And then they, they each also have some local bath uh, of uncorrelated noise, for example, from uh, local nuclear spins. And then I can just do uh, any pulse sequence I want, but let's say x, y, 8. I tip these things on the equator of the block sphere, let them accumulate phase. Uh, and then I do a, uh, a final pi over 2 pulse around the other axis and then correlate their outcomes. So I map the phase onto a population, and then I look at correlations in the population. And the key thing is I just do this a whole bunch of times. I measure how many photons I have, and I just compute the correlation at the end. So nothing fancy. I'm just doing simultaneous measurements and then calculating the correlation. There are some subtleties about how you want to do this mapping, but, but it's all, you know, it's essentially just a Ramsey. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so this all sounds very easy, uh, but the key thing uh, is that, um, so what we're trying to do is measure this underlying phase distribution, and then of course you impart a bunch of noise onto your measurement. So first there's quantum projection noise, uh, and then 
uh, more importantly, actually, NV centers have a lot of readout noise. So our ability to map this population uh, into a photon count uh, distribution is, is actually quite poor. And normally, we get around this by averaging for a very long time. Um, and, and one way to see this is that you know, if you have conventional readout, we get, um, you know, most of the time we're measuring no photons, and occasionally you get a photon. And if I'm trying to look at these correlations between two NV centers, the probability that I see a correlation, a coincidence event, is very low. Uh, so fortunately, there are ways to improve this readout fidelity with other methods. Um, so you can do, for example, spin-to-charge conversion, where you do spin-selective ionization, and then we are very good at measuring the charge state. You can do single-shot readout with extremely high fidelity of the charge state. Normally, you do not want to do this for conventional magnetic sensing because the overhead associated with this, uh, with this charge state readout is so large that it really eats into your sensitivity. But here, because we care about readout noise and readout noise really to the fourth power, we are willing to take this millisecond kind of readout time overhead in order to measure anything. And uh, you know, the way to think about this is really to look at, for example, a minimum uh, magnetic field amplitude. Uh, how long does it take you to get to a signal-to-noise ratio of one if you are trying to measure about a nanotesla amplitude field? Um, and for conventional readout, uh, to get to a nanotesla, it takes about a million seconds, uh, which is an uh, unacceptable fraction of a PhD. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you can do this optimally, which means that you're just quantum projection noise limited, um, you can get this down to you know, minutes. Um, and then for the spin-to-charge conversion, it's something like 10 to the 3 seconds, which is painful, but, but now doable. Um, OK, so then we experiment. So now we're armed with the right readout scheme, and we just have a way of computing correlations. Uh, we then set out to experimentally implement it, which is very straightforward. You just build a confocal microscope with two different channels and look at your two separate NV centers. Um, however, when we first uh, built this measurement, the main technical uh, complication is that you see a lot of trivial correlations when you try to hunt for correlations. So for example, if I just shake the table or if I have the laser uh, intensity um, you know, fluctuating, both of my NV centers will see that and it'll show up as a correlation. But there are sort of easy ways to diagnose that it's a trivial correlation. For example, you can do a point shift in the data and then you see these oscillations. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the process of building this 2NV measurement, I am now pretty confident that we have the best and most stable single NV measurement <laughs> because, because this was so hard. So anyway, we, we, we beat all of that down. And now we can uh, very clearly detect correlated noise. So, th so this is now, you take two NV centers um, and we do this XY8 sequence and the spin to charge conversion. And then I just look at uh, conditioned on when NV1 is dark, do I see that NV1 is bright or is it also dark? Um, and if I just apply uh, a, a global noise source, then what I see is this checkerboard pattern where when I'm on resonance with this global noise source, uh, when NV1 is dark, NV2 is dark. When NV1 is uh, bright, NV2 is bright. Um, and then because these are spins, I can do this trick where I now prepare the spins on just opposite sides of the block sphere and do the exact same measurement. And I find that the checkerboard pattern flips and these things are anti-correlated. Um, and then I can do things like just scan the interpulse uh, spacing in my XY8 sequence, and I find that I have a correlation uh, that looks like the noise uh, spectral bandwidth of the noise that, I, that I'm applying, and then a, a perfectly reflected anti-correlation. Um, okay. One minute. Two, okay. <laughs> one, one minute. We can negotiate one minute for that. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, all right, so now, so now that I have this, I can try to disentangle uh, different sources of noise because I have this spatially dependent uh, correlation signal. So let's say I was looking at a single NV center and I just did kind of a normal noise measurement. Then what I would see is, uh, say, two dips in my coherence decay that are both associated with different noise sources. Um, but now if I look in the dual uh, NV covariance channel, only one of them will pop out because one of them comes from a correlated source and the other one comes from an uncorrelated source. So I can now label these things as being correlated or uncorrelated as a function of their spatial position. All right, so this is just this measurement. Uh, this is the signal that we apply. This is some harmonic of the nitrogen-14 nuclear spin. And you can see that with the single NV measurements, you just see both of them, and you can't really tell the difference between them. But in the covariance channel, only the shared signal uh, shows up. So we can clearly label this as the uncorrelated source. Um, there's another kind of interesting thing, uh, another interesting opportunity when they both see correlated white noise, such that their coherence time is extremely short. Um, so here, 
uh, I apply you know, some broadband noise that decoheres both NV centers very quickly. Um, but then if I search out here way in the wings of the noise where you wouldn't expect to be able to see any signal, and I look in my covariance channel, then I see a little dip uh, that comes from this local nuclear spin. So the idea here is that even though the coherence time is very short, they are experiencing common mode noise. And by looking in this covariance channel, I can then separate out the common mode noise and recover my NMR signal. Okay, finally, there is another trick that I can pull, which is that, again, these are independently controllable spins. So if I find two spins that have different ESR frequencies, um, I can start the clock on one of them, wait an arbitrary time delay, and then start the clock on the other one, and look at the temporal decay of these correlations. So here, I'm applying a random phase uh, RF noise to both of them, um, and then scanning this delay time. And what you see is that you recover a coherent signal even though this measurement is phase random from shot to shot. So you're sort of doing, it's kind of like pump probe, but you're sort of doing this, uh, or, or like heterodyne. <laughs> but but you, you sort of recover this coherent measurement because I can stroboscopically start the measurement and then stop it um, at, e at each instance. And then that allows me to probe much smaller timescales than you could otherwise with just a single NV center. Okay, so to conclude, um, you know, what we've shown with this covariance magnetometry is really a method for measuring the two-point correlator at different positions in space and at different times at 100 nanometer to 100 micron uh, length scales. And the really interesting thing about this is that th this is not a physical quantity that is really accessible with other techniques. Um, so, you know, neutron scattering sort of gives you some picture of this correlation, but you're always averaging over a very large, uh, over a very large bulk sample, um, and you don't have any way of, of looking at these dynamics. Um, so we're now uh, rapidly uh, building up a big uh, condensed matter uh, sensing project in the group um, by looking at uh, mostly 2D materials first, because those are the easiest things to integrate with, uh, with diamonds. Um, so I'll just very quickly mention that um, you know, we have a few near-term technical directions. The first is everything that we've shown so far is at the diffraction limit, uh, but there is a natural extension using sub-diffraction limit imaging. This is some preliminary data where we have two overlapping NV centers. We can do the centroid fitting and spin-dependent fluorescence uh, to extract their positions with very high precision, and we can actually see this, uh, this correlation um, between two driven spins that are below the diffraction limit. Um, we're building up a camera so that you can do massively multiplex measurements um, and then coming up with different sort of device geometries for being able to integrate with different kinds of material systems. Okay, uh, so uh, the covariance work is led by Jared Rovney uh, in my group um, and was done in collaboration with Shimon Kolkowitz's group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I already mentioned that the, uh, the initial spin dynamics measurement was done in collaboration with Misha's group. Um, and that was led by Leela Rogers in my group and Bo Dwyer and Alana Urbach in, uh, in Misha's group. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>